on This Week in Enterprise Tech. Cisco gets the cloud, beware the vertical, and the last testing tool you might ever need. Quiet on the set. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Enterprise Tech is provided by CashFly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Twyatt, This Week in Enterprise Tech, Episode 84, recorded March 24th, 2014. Vertical, Desperate, and Tested. This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by TechServe, the world's largest independent Apple retailer and professional services provider. Go to techserve.com slash twyatt dash seven sins to get access to the free ebook on the seven deadly sins of iPad deployment. And by Prosper. Prosper is a peer-to-peer -peer lending marketplace that connects people who are looking to borrow money with those who have money to lend. Visit prosper.com slash twit and receive a $50 Amazon.com gift card when you get a loan. And by Ring Central. The cloud-based phone system we use just got better with the launch of Meetings, the full-service video conference feature. Zero startup costs and Ring Central starts at under $25 a month per user. Try it now with a 30-day risk-free trial and buy one desk phone and get a second phone free, up to 20 phones. Call 800-543-9980 or visit ringcentral.com and use our promo code TWIT. Welcome to Twyatt This Week in Enterprise Tech. It's the show dedicated to the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and the geek who just wants to know how the world is connected. I'm your host, Father Robert Balazer, the digital Jesuit, your guide to all things in the enterprise. But of course, I'm not alone. I'm joined by my close friends, my colleagues, my uber geek companions in arms, starting with Mr. Brian Chi, the director of the Advanced Network Computing Laboratory in Honolulu, Hawaii. Brian, are things heating up in Honolulu? Well, I'm getting ready to hop on a plane tomorrow to head to Interop. And oh, by the way, for the people who are curious, Mini Maker Fair Honolulu, 720 attendees. Nice. Woohoo! Nice, nice. And uh, that just tells you that if you are a real maker, well, you're, you're going to have to head over to Honolulu. Now, someone who else who is from a tropical environment, although it didn't feel like that when I was there last week, Mr. Curtis Franklin, the editor of, of Enterprise Efficiency. Curtis, how are you, my friend? I'm doing well, Padre. Uh, back from the chilly confines of Enterprise Connect uh, here at the Digital Swamp, getting ready to head out to Las Vegas. I won't be there till next weekend, but uh, rumor has it that next week all three of us will be there at Interop. That's strange. I, I think actually if all three of us are in the same place at the same time, it causes a split in the geek time continuum. But you know what? We just got to risk these things for progress. Speaking of progress, let's get straight to it because we've got an action-packed show. Let's start off with this. Beware the vertical. Now, we've got a story from the Wall Street Journal, among other outlets, about how Apple has approached Comcast to offer their Apple TV along with a specific Comcast streaming service that would get better quality of service. So here, here's, here's how it's going to work. Comcast gets to bundle the Apple TV with their service. Apple gets preferential treatment for the traffic running through Comcast cable to their devices. Now, according to insiders, Comcast would provide higher levels of service for this content. And uh, although all these talks are preliminary, we know that Apple had tried to talk to the people over at Time Warner to get the same sort of deal. Now, this does sound very consumery until you actually look at the net neutrality implications. Chibert, let me throw this to you first. Is the future of a net neutral, less internet what we're seeing here, where individual vendors, individual manufacturers are going to go to the owners of the pipes and say, I'm going to pay you to give me a competitive advantage over my competitors? Well, you know, we've already started getting that. Here in Honolulu, we, we have, you know, triple play, you know, data, video, and voice of various providers. Now, the trick is the different providers, the different sections are actually different business units, so they're actually selling priorities to each other. So we've already started to get prioritization in VLANs, especially for VoIP services, but we're also starting to get some prioritization of consumer versus business. So getting directly to the point is, we're already starting to see this, and yes, 
Um, net neutrality means, you know, everybody's got to play on an even field. But I don't think this is going to be what's going to happen. I think, yes, he who votes with his dollars is going to get priority. And Comcast has a heck of a lot of dollars. Uh, personally, I think we're going to start seeing a widespread adoption of MPLS so that, for instance, if Netflix wants to provide priority to their data, but pass it through to another, um, say, Time Warner, it might be passed using a technology like MPLS because you don't have to have it all the way through. You can just pass the labels and in between, if you don't have MPLS support, it just kind of does best effort. Curtis, let me throw this over to you. Uh, I know there's going to be a lot of people out there who are saying, look, this, this is just how the free market works. Comcast has a product, they want to sell it. Apple has a product, they want to sell it. They want to do a partnership with one another. What's so wrong with that? But here's the thing, and this is where I want to get your input. If this is allowed to stand, I'm sure every sector of of every industry connected to the internet is looking at this case because if they're allowed to do this, this sets the precedent, right? You can now shake down anyone who wants to run any bits over your pipes. In other words, if I make a deal with Time Warner and X makes a, a deal with, with Verizon and Y makes a deal with Comcast, now we have different devices that work better on a specific network and and we've got this in this this vertical that uh, is is shutting out any sort of innovative competition oh absolutely i think one of the things this absolutely does is make it much harder for startups to come in and compete on anything like a reasonable basis with the entrenched players and it's not just the streaming companies. Now, we, we talk about the Netflix, the, the Apples, uh, the Googles, those who are providing content in a streaming fashion. But think about how this could go in other directions. Uh, what if all of a sudden Walmart decided that it wanted to be a bigger player in online sales? It could try to get preferential treatment compared to what Amazon was getting for its various offerings. What if, uh, say, Bank of America decided that it wanted to steal a march on Wells Fargo? Uh, you could find yourself doing much better performance if you're balancing your checkbook on Bank of America's website than you can with uh, Wells Fargo's. There are all kinds of implications for something like this, and I think it launches us on a slippery slope. The question is whether the FCC is going to be able to come in with net neutrality regulations that will survive a court challenge and whether doing that will replace some of these deals that are going down now a lot of uncertainty coming up um, a lot of cios have big headaches on their hands chivert i want to throw this back over to you because we had a case with netflix being shaken down by comcast and we assume that netflix just had willing and made the agreement but in a recent blog post on netflix own page they essentially said look we did this begrudgingly what people don't realize is we've already been shaken down by some of the major providers Netflix has to pay a, a special tax to Level 3 and to Cogent and to all the main backbone providers, so Comcast was just the last mile to get to the customers. If a company like Netflix, which you know un un undoubtedly provides about 30% of the traffic that's running through these ISPs, can be shaken down, it, it tells me that everyone can be shaken down. But, but my question to you specifically on the technology side is how does this actually work? Let's say Apple does make an agreement with Comcast. Either Apple has to put server farms on all of the Comcast nodes, or Apple also has to make arrangements with Level 3 and Cogent and any other ISP that might be along that pipe if they're going to guarantee preferential performance for the Apple TV. Yeah, definitely. There's going to have to be a lot of agreements. A lot of engineers are going to have to talk to each other. Uh, one of the things that I really and truly fear, though, is these uh, agreements reaching all the way into the DNS. So that if someone tries to go and look for something, what's to keep the unscrupulous from saying, for instance, I'm anti-Netflix, -Net I'm going to delay your DNS lookup by X number of milliseconds so that maybe you're going to go to someone else. Um, someone else with better performance. That That's a, a slippery slope I'm really, really afraid of. Yeah. I, I want to leave you with the last word on this, Curtis. As we start to look at this, and again, this is still very early days. We have no idea whether or not this deal is going to come to, through to fruition. And beyond that, we don't know if, if they make an agreement, if it will actually be uh, approved by the regulators. But 
unless we have some sort of net neutrality regulations that say that every byte that is transferred on the internet must be treated equally, we're going to see more and more of this, right? I mean, because without net neutrality regulations, this is now a profit stream. I, it's not just that I can per, uh, charge you for access. It's not just that I can charge you for the data that's going through my tubes. I can now charge you based on how fast you want that data to be delivered. Oh, absolutely. And let's remember that there is a, an extent to which this is, in fact, a zero-sum game. That means if companies like, say, Netflix or Amazon or Apple are being advantaged through these deals, then somebody must be disadvantaged. That someone could well be you and your corporate uh, parent if you're doing telecommuting, if you're doing work from home, if you are in a small branch office or a home office that's using a cable modem as your primary way to get to the internet. Um, all of a sudden, we're in a world where if you are a telecommuter, if you are someone in a very small branch office using a, a cable modem, you're being shaken down as well. It's almost as though the cable company is knocking on your door with a it would be a shame should an accident befall your data stream kind of argument. I don't think any of us want that to be the case, but, you know, that's the door that's been opened, and we're walking through it in a big way. Well, let's move on to something a bit more cheery than net neutrality. And how about this? Spying. That's right. We've got a story here from Der Spiegel, who, by the way, they, they were well represented on Tech News Today this morning. They have a, a bit of information from the Snowden papers that show that the NSA was actively looking to penetrate various networks inside of China, including banks, those of government officials, uh, the trade ministry, basically anything that could give us some sort of competitive edge. But specifically that what they were trying to do was to penetrate Huawei, the major enterprise class network equipment manufacturer in China. The program was called Shot Giant. And according to the papers, they succeeded in infiltrating Huawei's network. They copied a customer list with over 1,400 of their customers and Importantly, they got the source code for their switches and routers. Now, I want to throw this over to you, Chiever, because we do actually have some experience with Huawei. What's your first impression of this? I mean, is, is this just the cost of doing business? Is this groundbreaking? Is this shameful? What is this? Oh, but all the source code says HP or Cisco already. <laughs> oh, did I say that out loud? No, and, and actually, without the snarkiness, let me, let me point out that yes, the, the source code actually does say HP. They, they licensed that source, co source code from HP. In fact, and I think I can talk about this now, when we had when we were working with Cisco, uh, not Cisco, with Huawei equipment not too far uh, back, whenever we got a uh, an error, it would actually tell us to contact the HP 800 number because they hadn't changed that part of the code. But, uh, but Chiebert, this is, an, is this a big thing? I mean, do we really care about this? Because it seems to me that I, people in IT kind of take the, the, the approach that, well, of course they're doing this. I mean, this is what a spy agency does. Yeah. And, you know, gee, couldn't have happened to a nicer group of people. Um, when you have a corporation that has a nation state behind it, it starts to get smacking of uh, monopolistic practices and a lot of other things that the U.S. doesn't really like. Um, Huawei has continuously stated, no, we do not have the Chinese government behind us. But yet, gee, where does all, where does all that money come from? Why are they flying in entire teams on a 747 to rewrite DSL, DSLAM code for government contracts? I can't imagine there's any possible way of making any money on something like that. They're literally buying contracts. Why is this happening? It's probably because uh, Huawei is probably directly connected to the MSS, the Chinese spy agency. So do unto others as they shall do unto you. Curtis, let me let me go over to you as as the person in this chat who has not in any way, shape, or form worked in intelligence. Um, from the enterprise side, this could be a little bit scary because it looks like state-sponsored corporate espionage. But... Is it really that bad? I mean, you got to assume that most of, of uh, the major IT corporations on the planet understand that their most valuable asset is their source code, and of course people are trying to get it. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the, as Brian said, this, this falls well into the there's no news value in this for anyone in the industry. And to a great extent, there, there could not be, from the U.S. side, 
a less sympathetic victim than Huawei because everyone knows that Huawei has been pretty aggressive in trying to find out what's going on inside their competitors' boxes. Um, this has gone on for a long time at a lot of different levels uh, because of some, some business that I've been in uh, during uh, gaps in my journalistic career. Uh, I have watched corporations play these games. I've seen the links that they go to. Um, and everyone assumes that the various spy agencies are doing the same thing. So while this makes great copy, and it certainly plays into the general story about industrial and government espionage, there's just not a whole lot of new stuff here for most of us in the IT industry. Yeah, I, I agree. I absolutely agree. Now, when we come back, we're going to be talking all about Cisco. We're going to be talking about how they're trying to tackle a web service giant. But before that, I thought maybe we should take some time to talk about the first supporter of the Twite Riot, and that's Texer. Now, we know that Apple products are big, and it's not just the consumer market anymore. It may have started with people who wanted to buy still use at home, but the iPad and its related products have become sort of the de facto standard for BYOD. That's bring your own device. It's how we do business, which is why I'm so happy to have TechServe as a supporter of this week in enterprise tech. Now, we're seeing some amazing technology solutions deployed on iPads these days. Businesses keep coming up with creative ways to service their customers, increase productivity among employees, and make more money with the same resources, all by using the iPad. For example, the Institute of Culinary Education equips students, faculty, and chefs with the iPad, empowering them to do away with heavy and unwieldy textbooks and streamlining the learning process. A major cable service provider in the Northeast gave its field technicians, who really are the public face of the company, iPads that had been used and configured to provide better service to customers. And retail companies have enhanced their in-store customer experience by using the iPad, not just as a point of sale device, but also as a spot where customers can learn about sales, special promotions, and upcoming events. These clients and more have turned to TechServe, the country's largest Apple reseller that sells, supports, and manages the largest iPad deployments in the world to manage their iPad projects. If you're considering adding iPads to your business, why not ensure the project's success with an experienced partner? TechServe assists businesses of all sizes to deploy Apple solutions, as well as solutions from Avid, Adobe, and more. Throughout the United States, no matter if you've started deploying iPads or already just getting started, TechServe can help. Right now, TechServe is offering a complimentary download for Twiat listeners who are deploying iPads or who are inter interested in learning more about what iPads can do for them. We'd like you to go to TechServe.com slash Twiat dash seven sins. That's TechServe.com slash Twiat dash seven sins to get access to the seven deadly sins of iPad deployment and see the common pitfalls that throw companies for a loop during their iPad projects. This complimentary download is available right now for free, just for Twiat listeners at T-E-K-S-E-R-V-E dot com slash Twiat dash seven cents. And we thank TechSir for their support of this week in enterprise tech. Let's get back to it. We've got a story that I actually think is huge. I don't think it's getting a lot of mainstream coverage, but it has major ramifications for the enterprise market. And that is Cisco jumping into the cloud services fray. Now, we know that Amazon rules the roost as far as web services are concerned. There are many other providers out there, but Amazon is the biggest. Cisco has now pledged to spend over a billion dollars in the next two years to offer a competing cloud computing service. They want to build out data centers that will run Cisco cloud services. And uh, we know that Cisco does $49 billion in sales, and they like to get a little piece of the pie, the $3 billion pie that Amazon pulls in from their cloud compute services. Now, I I'm going to throw the first question over to you, Cheever. We know that it took Amazon the better part of a decade to build out their cloud compute, their, their cloud service offerings, and that the build-out was really just an extension of the build-out that they already had to do to support Amazon.com. It takes a lot of logistics, a lot of processing power, and a lot of communications to be able to run an operation that is as worldwide spanning as Amazon.com. My question to you is this, Cisco doesn't have that need. They don't run a re online retail presence. They don't need to build out data centers to support their logistics. They're only building out to do this cloud computing service. 
is a billion dollars over two years really enough to compete with someone who's had such a big head start? I think it might be, especially because keep in mind, Amazon had a really big uphill battle that they had to deal with first. Nobody knew what a cloud was. Nobody had, you know, there's this huge FUD factor about clouds. Even today, I'm running into a lot of people say, oh, clouds are bad. They're, they're not secure. It's like, no, I'm sorry. They're just different. Well, Cisco doesn't have that problem to deal with. They're starting off on the ground running. And if they're throwing a billion dollars at it, basically what they're trying to do is look for the enterprise that wants off-premise synchronization, to be able to have a cloud so that I can globally load down, to have a cloud so that I have a secondary location instead of having to build it for myself. And that what they're doing is they are leveraging their current virtualized and private cloud customers. So it makes a lot of sense and, um, you know, we'll see. Right, right. Curtis, let me throw this over to you. We know that this is, even though they, 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 they pitch it as they're now going head to head with Amazon, it's not really going head to head with Amazon. If you look at the actual content of the of the cloud compute options being offered by each, Amazon, which again is the avowed leader of cloud services right now, they become very popular, especially among startups. Many startups who haven't ever built out their own infrastructure. It used to be when you were starting a company, you built out your infrastructure, and then as you needed to, you would hire out. With Amazon cloud services, we now have these startups that have never owned a stitch of equipment on their own. They don't have to. In fact, it, it's, been, uh, it's been reported that for every three to four dollars a startup used to spend on their own infrastructure, they now spend a dollar on Amazon cloud compute. Cisco, on the other hand, they're not really going after the startups. If you look at the services that they're offering, they're going after established enterprises, large enterprises, and government offices. Those who already have their own infrastructure and yet want something that's extensible. They want to be able to, as, as Chibert said, to sync off-site. Or they want something to be able to expand during those times in which they need a burst of computing power. If they're not really going head-to-head, -head, what do you see the pitch being for a, uh, a, an enterprise executive who, who is now considering whether or not they're going to go with Amazon Cloud Compute or Cisco Cloud Services? Well, I think you're exactly right. While they're talking about Amazon Web Services, that's not their real competitor. I think their real competitor is SAP. You know, SAP bought Ariba, SAP bought SuccessFactors because SAP realized that especially with its HANA platform, it had created a solution that was too expensive for all but the largest companies to really take advantage of. They went with cloud to expand their market down. And I think Cisco is going to be, um, I'm sorry, um, Yes, Cisco is going to be doing the same sort of thing. They're looking to expand who can take advantage of their offering down a bit, but they don't want to go all the way into the small business segment. They don't want to go all the way into the startup. What they want to do is eat away at those mid-tier companies that are looking at SAP's cloud as a way to get into its solution, have them do Cisco instead. Uh, to me, that's their real competitor. Uh, look at those marketing characteristics. Look at those applications. Look at Oracle. And that's where you're going to see the real competition for what Cisco's doing. N not so much Amazon. I like that. I, actually, I really, really like that point. Yeah, they, they may not actually be a competitor to Amazon. Amazon can take the startup market. Cisco, I think, wants a more discerning customer. They want that established enterprise. But Chibert, let me throw this over to you. Another big differentiator between Amazon Cloud Compute and Cisco Cloud Services is Cisco is building this out to be usable with those third-party platforms. Whereas you have to program for Amazon Cloud Compute, Cisco's new cloud service will be able to will be compatible with SAP, with Microsoft, with VMware. In other words, you should be able to take a virtual machine, a virtual server, and spin it up on Cisco services without any real configuration. In that sense, this would seem to be far more attractive to the enterprise customer. Well, it's, you know, if you're starting to, when you start talking about this, this is more along the lines of when Amazon services are the, their virtual infrastructure. So yeah, this is very different. 
This is extending a lot of the work of wide area network synchronization of VMs that Microsoft has done and VMware has done. It's the next logical step. And what's nice about this whole thing is, yeah, being able to differentiate yourself so you don't, you aren't tied to a specific platform. From my point of view, as a consultant, that's a really, really good thing. And in our, Kurt and I, we did a cloud, cloud computing book. It's one of the predictions we made in futures that more and more the market is going to push cloud computing into a point where I don't care what's underneath. I just want to be able to move it around. In fact, someday I want to be able to move it around based upon an automated bidding system so that this month I might be using Amazon, that month I might be using Cisco, the next month I might be using Microsoft. I want to be able to move my tasks around and I want to be able to bid this out automatically. It's an interesting future. Whether it'll happen or not, I don't know. Chiba, one more question to you, a follow-up. If this does take off, and, and Cisco does have the muscle to put behind it, and they do have the engineering brains to make this work really, really nicely, what happens to a service like Microsoft Azure? Well, I think Microsoft Azure still has a lot of place. You know, there, it's, it's a great development platform. It has the ability to do a really great job of allowing you to very easily move between a private cloud and a public cloud. Um, I, I think I see Microsoft and VMware actually looking at more and more things in common, uh, translating a VM from the Microsoft world to the um, VMware world is not as hard as it used to be. In fact, it's now possible, whereas before it wasn't. Um, so yeah, we're gonna start seeing a lot of um, things, a lot of um, good things. Now keep in mind, one of the things that Windows Azure has that has a really huge advantage is being able to have Active Directory authentication accounts that don't cost a cow. That's a pretty big deal, especially since no matter what Cisco is doing, it's probably still going to be a Microsoft server platform at the enterprise. So having the ability to go and do federated um, authentication against the cloud and locally and not have to pay cows is a pretty big thing. And I don't think Azure is going to go away anytime soon for that very reason. Actually, very, very good point. Yeah, I mean, it's one thing to be able to run Microsoft services on top of Cisco's cloud services. But if Microsoft could do it with one less level of complexity and with one less level of licensing, I think that still makes it very attractive. Last question goes over to you, Curtis, and that is this. We were just at Enterprise Connect, and I remember sitting through a lot of those keynotes, and, and one of the, the tidbits of information that was being passed around was something that was created by the Transparency Market Research Group, and they projected that the UC market is going to grow from $22.8 billion in 2011 to almost $62 billion in 2018. Now, obviously, Cisco wants a piece of that. And, and from the moves that we heard about at the conference, it seems that they're, they're absolutely putting themselves in a position to be able to do that. But what do you see being the strategy here? They, all, they already exist in 90% of data closets. They already run most of the infrastructure of most of the enterprises across this planet. Now it seems like they want not just the, the device that sits on your desk for unified communications, but they also want the back end. What's the end game? Well, I think one of the end games is something that we haven't talked about. You know, we're talking a lot about the vendor. We're talking a lot about the customer. What we're not talking about is the reseller channel. And for Cisco, as well as most of these other companies that we're talking about, notably not Amazon, uh, the channel is critically important. That's all of the, the VARs, the system integrators, the various companies that put together entire solutions out of the bits and pieces that make up the infrastructure and the application chain. That's hugely important for Cisco. And I wouldn't be at all surprised if they had looked at this and heard from their reseller and integrator channel that they needed a Cisco branded cloud to provide another uh, arrow in their quiver to go to companies with to provide solutions. If Cisco can brand those integrators, then that's a huge win because again, in this mid-tier that everyone's targeting, integrators are hugely important. The mid-tier tends not to have the professional staff on hand to do all the integration themselves. 
They depend on those third-party integrators. Those third-party integrators depend on companies like Cisco to provide them the bits and pieces to make the solutions happen. Gentlemen, thank you so very much for those Enterprise Bytes. I, I love it whenever we, we finish up this segment and it feels like I've just run a marathon, even though I really wouldn't know what it feels like to run a marathon. Now, when we come back, we're going to take a look at a tool that could become the cornerstone of every IT tool belt. It's powerful, it's flexible, it's affordable, and believe it or not, it's a fluke. But before that, let's go ahead and take a break to talk about the second sponsor of the Twight Right, and of course, I'm talking about Prosper. Now, what would you do if I told you that in 72 hours you could have $35,000 to cover your needs? Uh, what would you do with that $35,000? Would you pay off your high-rate credit cards? Would you finally do that home improvement program that you've been putting off for years and years and years? Or would you start a brand new business? Well, what if I told you that by filling out an easy online application and providing a few details, you could see a rate online instantly without ever stepping foot in a bank? Well, that's not a fantasy, folks. That's Prosper. Prosper is an innovative peer-to-peer -peer lending process. It's Silicon Valley's answer to a more modern community-based personal loan. There are no outrageous fees, no raising interest rates, and yes, you'll never set foot in a bank. Now, this is a peer-to-peer -peer lending service. We've heard of programs like this usually in third-world countries or as micro-loans, but it's time that peer-to-peer -peer made its way to our financial reality. Prosper does that. It connects people who need money with those who have it to loan. It's really that simple. Prosper offers low fixed rates, unsecured personal loans, which means no collateral will be required, and has multi-years terms available. Prosper has more than 2 million members, both lenders and borrowers, and over 900 million in funded loans. You can just go to prosper.com slash twit to check your rate instantly without affecting your credit score. Now, here's what we want you to do. We want you to join in the financial revolution. For a limited time, Prosper is offering Twit viewers a $50 Amazon gift card when you get a loan. Go to prosper.com slash twit. It's a special, special site just for our viewers. Up to $35,000 in just three days and receive a $50 Amazon.com gift card when you do get a loan. Prosper.com is not affiliated with Amazon. For gift card details, visit prosper.com slash twit. And we thank Prosper for their support of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Let's bring in our guest. Ladies and gentlemen, we have James Kakaska, who is an engineer with Fluke Network. James, it's good to have you on the show. Thank you for visiting. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Now, James, you're on the show because, uh, well, Chibert found that you're, uh, you're introducing a brand new tool, a, a brand new device that you think is going to become very popular in IT. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, it seems like as we went out and talked to uh, a lot of customers, uh, especially in small and medium businesses and prosumers and system integrators and, uh, and uh, uh, factory floors and things like that, kind of uncarpeted ethernet areas that, that uh, they just uh, kind of gave us consistent feedback. Our, our tools were uh, too expensive, too complicated or too bulky. So uh, we tried to address that need with a new product we call Link Sprinter. Link Sprinter. Now, this is different for, for a, a number of reasons, but the, the number one reason is that Fluke had previously only been sold through authorized value resellers, right? You, you only went through VARs. This is more, I, I'm going to say, consumer-friendly. Yeah, very consumer-friendly. Think about uh, like a Fitbit or a Square or something like that, a very asset light device that leverages the phone and mobile devices, tablets, or uh, or phones uh, as much as they can to uh, drop the price and also provide a bunch of new uh, workflows. James, let, let me back up and, and sort of take the 10,000 foot view here. When Fluke makes a new device, and by the way, I, I'm a long time Fluke tool user. Everyone here in the studio uses Fluke tools. I think Fluke is typically associated with quality. It, it is among the best tools that you can find on the market. But when you're designing a new tool, especially a network testing tool, what what goes into the design process? What do you how do you decide what you're going to put in, what you're going to leave out, and what fe what features you think you're going to expand to? Well, uh, specifically in this case, uh, we we had a pretty good sense of of what we wanted to include in an auto test. We wanted to empower people to uh, who who were kind of up and coming in networking or 
you know, just not the, the, the hardcore network engineer to be empowered with uh, uh, great troubleshooting capabilities. And so we took, you know, roughly a couple decades of uh, uh, testing, uh, troubleshooting knowledge and boiled it down into five or six simple steps uh, that we basically present on backlit uh, LEDs or on your phone or uh, even in the cloud. Okay, now let, let's let's actually talk about that. So when someone has a fluke tool, let, let's say I'm, I'm a brand new IT engineer, I, I've got my fluke tool in my hands, what is typically the process that, that I would use to use that tool to diagnose a problem on my network? Well, basically it's a set of steps. Uh, it starts with, can I get PoE? This is especially important with uh, more IP surveillance, uh, VoIP phones, and of course, APs. Uh, and then the next thing is, can I link? Uh, can I link at 10, 100 gig? What uh, speeds and duplexes is the switch port advertising? Uh, in the case of gig, we're using all four pairs, of course. Uh, and then can I get a DHCP address? Or if I have an assigned static address, is it a dupe? Uh, and then assuming you have a good DHCP address, can I get to the edge of my premise, which is the router or gateway? Uh, and then after that, can I get out to the, to the cloud? And the cloud meaning uh, a DNS lookup of something like Google, uh, and, and uh, not just a ping, but a, a TCP port open. So whenever we have a tool, and actually, uh, Tibert, back me up on this. This brings me back to my early days at, uh, at Interrupt when I was learning the proper way to diagnose a problem. You know, you always look for, you, you want PoE, because you want to know what kind of switch you're connected to, you want to know what the capabilities are. Then you check link, then you check speed, then you check DHCP, then you check ping, then you check connectivity to the outside world. I mean, this is this is pretty much these are the steps that we've all we've all grown up right, uh, grown up with, right, Chiever? You bet. You know, it, when I first saw the Link Sprinter, one of the comments I told James was, "Oh my God, it looks exactly like the process we use to deliver the network in the booths at uh, Interop." Uh, but more importantly, this is the kind of things that you should be doing everywhere. It's the kinds of things you should be doing every single time. And because the link sprinters um, leverage LLDP and CDP, it can actually pull out switch information so they can help you on your inventory. Because I don't know about you, but my inventory is not always that accurate. And having all this information being pushed to the cloud and where I can then download it in a CBS or a PDF file goes a long, long way to creating a self-documenting process. Now, James, I want to go back to you because our, our TD just showed a picture of what the uh, the Link Sprinter looks like. And you can't help but notice that it doesn't look like a typical Fluke tool. I'm, I mean, it, it's got the yellow, it's got the blue, so it's got the branding. But when I think of the Fluke tools that we used to use, it, they always had an LCD screen. Some of them had a full color uh, LCD screen, uh, giving you every sort of, of information that you could possibly get. This looks more like, uh, you know, a, a, a dumb tool. Uh, why, why is this? Why, why would you go with that sort of design? Well, uh, a lot of it was we wanted it to be ubiquitous. And you, know, you think about uh, how much cameras get used now because they just happen to be in your pocket. So one of the original challenges to our uh, uh, industrial design team was to make it fit in a Levi's watch pocket. Uh, and then we did these uh, uh, backlit LED illuminations uh, because uh, typically in seven to 10 seconds, we, we completely test the network and, and give you a, a very fast triage there. And then if you need more details, uh, it's actually got a wireless access point built in and you can associate your phone and, and there you can discover what switch slot port you're plugged into or what the advertised uh, VLAN is, uh, what the response times are from the cloud and things like that. So uh, what we're really trying to do was to, to, to move down market and, and create a, a product at this price point that we can get to this you know, vast population of uh, ethernet touchers. You know, it's everything from a prosumer uh, on his network block, a technology teacher, uh, system integrators uh, who are, you know, notoriously don't buy uh, test tools, they'll swap out devices rather than do uh, deterministic troubleshooting. And so uh, by leveraging the, the, the screen, your, your phone, that everybody had a smartphone, uh, as the UI, we were able, of course, to pull cost and size out of the product. So it's kind of, it's, 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 you know, very asset light. 
Uh, and kind of the tester you have in your pocket is better than the, the one that's back on your desk sort of thinking. I love that. I love that. So you're leveraging the power devices that we already have, not including them with the tool, stripping down the tool to the bare essentials, and then just using those devices that we have to have. Now, we've got, to, we've got a great chat room here, and we've got user max1234, who has a very simple question. He wants to know if the uh, link sprinter can actually measure QoS, and if so, how it does that. It actually doesn't measure QoS. We're, uh, this product in particular is just going for basic network connectivity uh, for PC technicians or before you install an access point or for documenting your, your network. And so uh, about the closest we get to that is that uh, we show you the VLAN that is uh, being advertised from the switch port that you're plugged into. Right, right. Now, one of the things that I, I really like about this, this new platform choice is the fact that since a lot of the smarts are built into other devices, it would seem to me that it's an, a much more extensible platform. It's a much more extensible tool. Whereas when I had my old my old link runner or my net tool, uh, I, everything was baked into the firmware. And if I needed something that wasn't available in that firmware, I either had to get a brand new tool or I had to purchase a brand new firmware. It seems that with the way you've created the this new, this new tool, the smarts contained elsewhere can be upgraded without changing off the tool. Yeah, not only can we add a lot of functionality strictly in the cloud, uh, but, uh, but when it does come to firmware time, it actually updates through the cloud. So you plug in, if we have an update that we want to push out, uh, we'll send you an email, but basically the next time you test, it will push uh, the new firmware in. And so you don't need to go through the you know, the commotion of a PC app, and of course that's assuming you have a PC even, right? You might have a Mac, uh, or, or even just a tablet. So you don't have to get to a PC, USB, plug-in, sort of dedicated download the binary situation. It just updates in 20 seconds right off the cloud. So our ability to not only move that uh, quickly in the firmware, but of course in the cloud uh, uh, goes up dramatically. I like that. Now, James, when we come back, uh, will you will you be willing to take us through a demo to actually show us how this tool works? Yeah, it'd be my pleasure. All right. So we look have we have that to look forward to after the jump. But before we do, let's go ahead and thank our last sponsor on this episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech. And of course, that's Ring Central. Uh, when we built this studio, we decided that we wanted to be a model. We had been telling everybody that they needed to move into the cloud. They needed to trust the internet. And so we said, hey, we should do the same thing. That's why everything is in the cloud. That's where we do our document sharing, our schedule sharing, our email. And then when our IT guy t came to us, you may know him, his name is Russell. He told us that we could have a full featured PBX without having a clunky system in the basement, without a lot of wires running every which way, without having to have a dedicated maintenance person to, to come in and change something anytime we needed to move an extension or change an employee name. That's why we went and we love Ring Central. Now, Ring Central has zero startup costs, no PBX hardware to install or maintain, and now Ring Central has launched meetings. So, in addition to all that we love about Ring Central, namely receiving voicemails through our email, sending and receiving fax messages from our smartphones, the auto receptionist who greets our callers and announces employees and department extensions. Now with meetings, we can host face-to-face -face meetings in a high-definition chat and share desktop or documents with anyone, anytime, anywhere, on any device. Meetings makes Ring Central the single best business solution on the market today. Now, here's what we want you to do. We want you to see if Ring Central might be as good for your business as it was for ours. Ring Central offers all inclusive pricing under $25 per month per user. You can start, start right now with a 30 day risk free trial, and they have a special offer for my listeners. When you buy one desk phone, you get one phone free, up to 20 phones. So call this number designated for my listeners, 800-543-9980. That's 800-543-9980. One more time, 800-543-9980. Or you can go to ringcentral.com and use our promo code TWIT. That's ringcentral.com, promo code TWIT. And we thank Ring Central for their support of this week in enterprise tech. James, let's get back to it. You promised us a demo. Let's see this in action. All right, so here's the product. Uh, so you can see it's small, light, you know, 
the ruggedness you'd expect, uh, you know, drop it off a ladder. Uh, and actually, for the sake of this demo, I actually took the batteries out. Uh, so it uh, turns out we built a PD in the head end, much like you'd find in a phone or camera. Uh, so I already plugged in. Uh, you can see the uh, lightning bolt here is uh, indicating that I got uh, PoE, uh, then that I'm linked. Uh, now I'm getting a DHCP address, uh, which I then got. Now we're testing to the uh, testing to the edge of the premise, and then testing out to the cloud. So that's the product here. You can see basically a 10-second test uh, to to validate uh, that part of your network. Now, if I needed more details, I would tap the power button. This turns on a Wi-Fi access point in the uh, in the product, and then I can take any phone or tablet, and uh, and basically. Uh, 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 point my browser, associate to the SSID, uh, so we're not using an app, uh, so we'll work with any device, uh, Windows Phone, basically anything with a, uh, with a Wi-Fi client and a browser, and then we serve up HTML5, so it looks just like an app. So uh, basically, here I see the same information, but now I have the details. It's actually 48 volts of PoE, the switch is 10100 advertising half and full duplex. There's the name of the switch that I'm plugged into, the DHCP address that I'm using, uh, the address of the gateway, and then Google. And you can touch any of these, and it expands to show you uh, more details. So here, for example, under the switch, uh, we catch uh, LLDP, CDP, or EDP uh, uh, switch discovery protocols. And here you can see the name of the switch, uh, the port that I'm plugged into. In this case, I know that I'm plugged into port 80, so great for uh, unraveling uh, uh, you know, spaghetti wiring or understanding where exactly where you're plugged into. Uh, I'm on a, a VLAN 196 with a voice VLAN of uh, 211, and here's the model of the switch and the IP address. And then, likewise, other details. Under DHCP, I have the server, DNS. Uh, get to something like a Google, we show you that the IP address that we resolved to, as well as the response times. So that's sort of the local, traditional testing model that you're used to with a, with a product. It's just that you use your phone or tablet as a UI. At the same time that that happened, though, uh, we pushed the results to the cloud. And another uh, thing that we do is we then send them out to an email address of your choice. So I also got those results to my, to my phone. And it's kind of a nice closed loop model. You plug in, you test, you know, over eight seconds, we, we, we test the network, and then we push the results to the cloud. The cloud emails them to your phone. And here you can see all the test details. So even if you don't want to reassociate your phone, uh, to the built-in AP, which you could do in a troubleshooting scenario if we couldn't get out to the cloud, you'll get the results delivered right to your inbox. At the same time, uh, if we can switch to the cloud service screen, uh, at the same time, we also uh, collect all of your test results in the cloud. And so here they get timestamped. And one of the cool features about the email is that I can reply to the email when I get it and provide context information. So this might be a wall jack number or the MAC address of the access point that I'm about to install. And so kind of for the first time in the industry, you can tie together your layer two, your switched infrastructure. So now I would know that port uh, 40 on this particular switch goes to wall plate 23B, uh, or I could label this with a particular room. And so you can add these comments simply by replying to the test email. So it kind of shows you how leveraging uh, the cloud and the mobility creates these whole new uh, workflows and capabilities. Of course, all the results are accrued in the cloud here. I can generate uh, uh, test results, uh, reports, PDF, CSV. You can slice, dice, and filter, and time box. And you can name units. So if you have uh, uh, multiple technicians with uh, multiple units, of course, you can have, uh, well, here's, here's uh, James's link sprinter. And what test did James run in the seven-day seven period ending last week? or tests with errors. In fact, you can see a test here that we didn't get the third ping response off of our gateway. Uh, and that would correspond also to a yellow LED on the, on the product itself. So, uh, so basically, it's, it's a, a test, uh, capture the results in the cloud, uh, send them with email, let you add context if you want to reply to the email. Uh, and when you need to troubleshoot, uh, use the mobile device that you have, uh, uh, your phone or tablet. Uh, which is really nice. You know, they're never going to uh, take these form factors and you know add an RJ45. That would that would kind of blow it. Uh, and so uh, uh, 
So think of this sort of as, as the minimal hardware uh, sliver that we can do to, to allow you to do full up wired ethernet testing using the, the, the glass you already have in your pocket. James, it's, you're kind of blowing my, my mind here because uh, at first it looked like just a dumb tool. Just, you know, just plug it in, get some lights, okay, move on to the next one. But the fact that it could give you all that detail, either through a, a client connected to the device or through the cloud, uh, it just really opens up the possibilities. I, I know Chibert was talking about this in the chat room. We do a connectivity test for every booth on the show floor. It, that, that could run up into the hundreds, which typically in, involved us plugging in a, a networking tool, taking down a couple of the parameters, marking it off with home base. This could be as easy as someone going to every drop, plugging in the tool, waiting till it gets the internet, disconnecting, going to the next one and plugging it in, and then all those results get sent to a cloud stored database. Uh, that's that's completely different. Uh, I mean, th this is something that you could actually send out with completely untrained IT people. Say, we're having difficulty in this part of the building. Go ahead and plug this in. Wait till the last light turns solid and then come back and I'll have all the, the, the details of the test. Is this is this Fluke's new paradigm? I mean, yeah. are, are you going to be doing this with all your, all your gear? Uh... Uh, yeah, oh, yeah. I, th I think it's a direction for us, uh, you know, moving uh, down market and basically taking our testing expertise and making it uh, making uh, anybody uh, an expert, right? So you think of a PC help desk person just being able to unplug the cable from the back of the PC and just knowing whether or not it's the network or the PC. Uh, think of some uh, kid that gets assigned to running around every dorm room before the semester starts to make sure that the wired Ethernet is running. Uh, and so it really, or, or even if you have remote sites, small offices, things like that, you can just send one out. Uh, you know, it's small, light. Uh, in fact, I've, you know, basically you slip it in a FedEx envelope and it's, you know, uh, eight bucks to ship, right? And so anybody can plug it in anytime, anywhere and, and uh, really be a, a networking expert. And then at the same time, uh, since the results are all captured in the cloud, uh, the, the real expert can be watching and seeing what's going on uh, uh, from afar. Now, James, I, I do have to say that this kind of functionality is great, but this is kind of what I've expected from Fluke Gear. Here's the thing, and I, I know this is going to get the people in the chat room excited. When I think of Fluke Gear, even the, the most simple tester that gives me this kind of detail, I'm thinking of a device that's going to cost me somewhere between $800 to $1,500. I mean, that's sort of like the, the bare minimum. This is not priced at that price point. Yeah, we uh, basically are priced at $199 and $299. Uh, $299 is the model with the Wi-Fi. $199 is not, uh, not with Wi-Fi. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and also, we're, it's making it available through Amazon. So it's easy to, easy to buy. Uh, you know, if you're prime, you get it a couple days later, and, and uh, you're good to go. Plug in. Uh, claim it to your cloud service and uh, and start testing. Folks, there you have it. You've got an IT tool that you could put in an envelope, ship, and find out exactly what's going on in a remote network or give to your peons in your IT deployment and just tell them, hey, wait for the blinky lights. James, thank you so very much. I, I mean, really, uh, I, I love the fact that Fluke has come up with this idea. I love the fact that Fluke has come up with a tool that everyone should buy. Now, I'm not, I'm not just going to say can buy. I'm going to say if you're in IT, this is something you should have in your tool belt. It makes no sense not to. To get this kind of detailed data from any sort of test is, well, it's invaluable. And the fact that I can pay it without, buy it without breaking the bank, I, I just love it. So, James, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, thanks for having us. We appreciate it. Well, folks, you did it again. You used up another hour listening to the best dang enterprise podcast in the universe. That's according to nine out of 10 network testers. It's a survey I just took. But uh, I, I don't want to go j away just yet. I want to thank my panelists. I want to thank the people who made this show possible. James, let me start with you. We know that you're from Flute Networks, but do you, do you want to tell the folks at home where they can find you, where they can find the Link Sprinter, or where they can find Fluke on the internet? Yeah, uh, we built out a microsite. Just go to linksprinter.com, uh, as you see on the banner there, and uh, and you can read all about the product. Uh, you can watch videos, and uh, and and from there you can even click to uh, order it on Amazon. Thank you. And that's probably the best place to, to learn about the product. Thank you so much. And and how about this? Can I can I get this promise from you? Anytime you come up with a product like this, anytime Fluke's going to release some new hotness into the IT world, can can I ask you to come back on the show to show it off? 
Oh, I'd love to. I'd love to. And, uh, you know, we have a robust roadmap planned uh, uh, even for this product. And so, in fact, Brian's going to be helping me out there. So, and uh, we're also looking forward to having uh, a large number of units out at Interop to, to uh, where you guys can really uh, kick the tires on them. Fantastic. Ladies and gentlemen, James Kokoska from Flute Next Networks showing us off the new link runner, the sprint runner, I'm sorry. Uh, also, I want to thank my co-host, starting with Mr. Brian Chi. Brian, I know you just finished up Maker Fair. You saw you're probably a little tired with the Mini Maker in Honolulu, but you'll be in Interrupt next week. Is there anything else that the Twilight Riot should know about? Well, I wanted to give a shout out to the Link Sprinter team, and we've been having lots of conversations about where we can take this in the future. Lots and lots of very cool things on the burner. And uh, I'm really and truly hoping we're going to see an extensible platform someday in the future. And that's something really to look forward because then now it's just software to be able to kick off all kinds of complex tests and the mind boggles at what we might be able to do. Mind boggling indeed. Curtis Franklin, my good friend on the other coast, I will also see you next week in Interop. But between now and then, anything interesting happening over at Enterprise Efficiency? Well, Padre, we've got the last of our Interop preview episodes of E2 Radio coming up Thursday at 2 o'clock Eastern. Uh, we're going to be talking with one of the Interop conference keynoters about creativity in IT management. This is going to be a great show. We'd love to have a lot of people there. And then next week during Interop, there's going to be an episode of E2 Radio every single day at 2 o'clock Eastern, 11 o'clock Pacific and we're going to be having a lot of speakers, special guests, special projects, special features, you name it. If people haven't ever listened to E2 Radio, boy, next week's the time to get started. Absolutely. And folks, don't, don't forget, next week we will be coming to you live from the NOC at Interop Las Vegas. We're going to be showing you some new wireless systems from Ruckus. We're going to show you some of the real, in our hands, sprint runners from Fluke, and we're going to show you the greatest and the latest in IT tech. Now, we also want to thank you. That's right, you, the, the listener, the watcher, our viewer, our audience, our loyal Uber geeks. If you didn't come back each and every single week to listen to Twyet, to watch Twyet, to download each and every single one of our episodes, well, we couldn't just keep bringing you the, the best dang podcast in the universe. And so I want to do something for you. What I want to do is I want to give you a way to get our episodes automatically into the device of your choice. Just go to our webpage at twit.tv slash Twyet. There you'll find a drop-down menu that will show you all the ways you can get every episode into your iPad, your iPhone, your Android tablet or phone, your, your Mac, your PC, anything you want it. That's the way we'll do it. That's the way we've got it. And that's probably a song. I also want to say that uh, you should probably check out our YouTube page at youtube.com slash twiet. There you'll be able to find not just all of our episodes, but all of our individual segments. And we, we really add a lot of segments around Interop because that's when we get to sit down with the engineers who make everything go. Also, you can follow me on Twitter at twitter.com slash PadreSJ. That's at PadreSJ. If you follow me, you'll be able to know what we're going to be doing on every episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech. You can find out what I do in between episodes, and you can find out, yeah, what happens when I go to places like uh, Enterprise Connect in Orlando, Florida. By the way, that, that guy, I wasn't wearing my collar. He just put that in there, which was very strange because I didn't tell him I was a priest. Go figure. Also, did you know that we do this show live? If you come to live.twit.tv on Mondays at 2.30 p.m. Pacific time, you'll be able to see our pre-show, our post-show. You'll get to see when we go late and bump shows like Tech News Tonight. And if you drop into our live chat room at live.twit.tv, you'll be able to talk to me and my co-host during the show. It's all part of the experiment that is Twit TV. Finally, I want to thank everyone here in the Brick House who made this show possible to our wonderful uh, TD who's subbing for, for Jason, uh, Anthony. Uh, he's not going to show himself. He's, he's really shy. To Lisa, to Leo, and to everyone who works behind the scenes to make it run smoothly. I'm Father Robert Balasair. And remember, if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep quiet.